live everywhere. Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker, K Grow in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. It is Thursday, May 17th, 2018. Time for another show. I seem to be landing on that as a standard opening line, and uh, why not? It is time for another show. It's as plain as the nose on my face, which is, you know, relatively prominent, and uh, you should be able to see it without any additional assistance, telescopes or otherwise. Uh, well, still getting the thumbs up, by the way, I, I've not said for a long time. Thanks very much to Justice Putnam for getting up early, early, early in the West Coast morning to give us a thumbs up each day. Not always acknowledged, but always appreciated. Thanks very much, Justice, for running the machinery that allows us to bring you KGRO in the morning, in the morning, every morning, well, weekday mornings anyway, at uh, 9 a.m. Eastern and uh, early, early, early in the morning on the West Coast because there's like 17 hours difference or something. I never really looked that up. But uh, that I can tell you, it's one of the people are always telling me it's one of the greatest time differences in the world, in the history of the world. No one has ever had greater differences in time. I I don't know. Why not? We might as well do this. Uh, I don't even know where to start or where to finish today. There's really only one big, 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 gigantic story. And we'll obviously be talking about that. But we're once again without Greg Dworkin. And that is the big story of the day as far as I'm concerned. Uh, tornadoes have wiped out Connecticut, or at least it has knocked down some trees and that has taken power out in a lot of places. And it takes a long time to put those power lines back up so that they can be knocked down again next time there's a storm. It's, it's true. That's kind of how the process works. And, oh, I don't know, maybe they should bury those lines, but I guess they can't do that because something, something Connecticut and, uh, people don't want their gardens dug up, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a much better plan. Too bad we thought of that one last. It's kind of amazing when you think about it, how much of the infrastructure of the country uh, ended up becoming dependent. Maybe they didn't know at the time. I, mean, I think they knew that electricity was going to be a pretty big deal at the time. But the idea of like, well, what we'll do is we, you know, we can you can get electricity all over the country by uh, not only, of course, building electrical generating plants, but also then running wires to everything you want to power. And what an amazing thing that at some point in history, uh, they said, well, you know, we can make all these things electric and you can put lights in every house and run all sorts of household appliances. Maybe they weren't thinking quite that far down the road yet. Uh, Just by getting electricity to all these homes, what we'll do is, you know, build power stations every couple miles or whatever and burn everything you find. (laughs) <laughs> to turn turbines and then we'll run wires literally from every single one of these things to every house in America. What are you going to do with the wires? You're just going to leave them laying around. People will trip on them. People will run over them. Their horse carts, you know, their wagons and carriages will get caught on the wires. Uh, I know we'll put poles in the ground. We'll just bash poles into the ground every couple feet and then string the wires up along overhead. That's a horrible plan. That's a really bad idea. But uh, then again, I guess we were consumed with bad ideas. Uh, Electricity, I guess the the history of commercial electricity, probably full of bad ideas, including, is this a true story or maybe it's apocryphal? Didn't uh, Thomas Edison, in order to demonstrate the value of uh, what he thought should be the standard for delivering electricity. I can't remember whether it was alternating current and direct versus direct current, et cetera. That was the, that was the, the, the fight. And I can't remember which one he was uh, uh, advocating for, but it was his contention that the other uh, format, AC or DC, whichever it may have been, uh, was the more dangerous and that he used that dangerous current to electrocute an elephant. Is that right? I mean, this is sort of one of those dumb stories from history. May or may not actually be true, but it's awfully dumb sounding. And if it, if it is true, it's another one of these dumb th- Like, I guess that's the mindset from which they then decided, we'll just run wires. To every house. There was no other solution, clearly. But now uh, 
well, I, I, I don't know. There's still no solution, I don't think, for getting power to everybody's houses other than actually, you know, putting solar panels on people's houses. And that doesn't generate enough sometimes, whatever, all those problems, but still the wires. If those should be strung up on poles, nothing can happen to these poles, right? Well, okay, this is a long story about how, why isn't it easier for Greg to get back on his feet and uh and and join us on the show i'm i'm sorry we don't have him with us around here when they built the homes in the 1990s in this area which was otherwise cow pasture beforehand they decided they came upon the very brilliant idea i guess because there were not already homeowners here who would get upset with all the digging to bury the power lines and i don't know what other problems that might entail. And in a hundred years, we'll be back saying, I can't believe that they buried the power lines rather than launching them into space, looping them around the moon and then reconnecting them at the, I don't know what we'll think is a great idea in a hundred years, but it seems to me like we get a lot fewer power outages from our storms because when trees fall down, they don't hit the, the power lines. And it seems like an awfully dumb looking thing. And now when I drive in area, there's still parts of town and parts of the county, obviously, around us that have plenty of power lines and phone lines on the poles. And uh, But when you run into it and you, you're conscious of it, it's like ridiculous. We've become immune to it. Otherwise, that's what the landscape looks like. But what a terrible idea. And as a result, we will have to round up our own news for ourselves coming to us, in many cases, through some of those very same stupid wires that uh, brought us our, our telephone, our cable television, and our electricity. Bill in Portland, Maine, besides starting us off with a fantastic morning tweet, which I'll share with you in a moment, says, I can Google the Edison electrocuting an elephant footage on YouTube. I can, but of course... My hands are busy waving around manically while I talk about the ridiculousness of killing an elephant. For any reason, Trump boys, looking at you. Uh, so I can't type into the Google machine just yet. But you can Google the Edison electrocuting an elephant footage on YouTube so it's real and it exists, I guess. I hear the Trump brothers. Ah, there they are. Uh, show it every Saturday night at home with a big bucket of popcorn. It's their favorite comedy. I do believe that could be true. Now, he had previously tweeted, of course, that Daily Coast Radio is live now. We're like eight minutes into it already, nine minutes. To determine which Trump scandal he'll talk about first, Kager Rucks will spin the giant wheel of corruption. And it has landed on Trump. What do you know? Amazing. He occupies 99.9% .9 of the wheel, of course, and he's looking to buy that last percentage. He's just in a poor cash position at the moment. Um, before we get to that, let me just say... Uh, I tried it again yesterday, and I heard Yanny all day long. I'll get that out of the way. Um, I, the explainer videos were able to get me to hear Laurel by messing with the frequencies, but that's apparently it. I have a sneaking suspicion it may have something to do with the equipment, A, on which this thing was recorded, and B, on which you might be listening to it, although I have seen videos out there, and I'm glad people did them. They were fun. Of... Uh, two or more people getting different results hearing it on the same device. But I have a feeling that uh, if your devices tend toward the treble or toward the bass, you get one result or the other more often. But uh, the real answer, in case you happen to have missed it, is it did in fact say Laurel. And I that does not surprise me because it was, we were discussing it yesterday. What reason would anyone have for recording themselves at, at all saying the word Yanny? Because it's not a word or a name or anything like that. Although I did see a very funny video out there from Yanni laughing at the thing and saying, you know, you're pronouncing it wrong. It's Yanni, not Yanni. But uh, at least I could understand the idea of recording the word or name Laurel being said because that's a real thing. Uh, you would have to go way out of your way to come up with something. And I don't know how you would even land on the idea that that's going to sound like Laurel if you record it right and say Yanny. And that was the very fake sounding name, uh, uh, voice, etc. So I guess it's like some sort of weird harmonic thing as well. And uh, that's the end of it. But the real answer is it was uh, they found the person who originated the video. It was a high school student from Georgia somewhere who was recording his computer speakers 
um, uh, when they were playing the audio of a computer-generated voice saying the word slash name Laurel on some of these pronunciation sites. You can get a computer voice to pronounce any word for you. We've used it sometimes to straighten things out. Don't know who needed help saying Laurel, but it's out there if you need it. And they recorded it and then noticed this weird, uh, what would you say, uh, aural phenomenon and I guess shared it with the world. So it really was Laurel originally, uh, though apparently you're not entirely crazy if you heard Yanny. You just have different hearing than someone else, or or you can just blame this kid's terrible computer speakers. And why don't we do that? Because it's a good time to blame kids for being uh, young and inexperienced. Here's something I've been watching for the last day or two. I guess uh, some, what do you call it? A social media woman, young woman who just graduated from college, uh, who works for, what is it, Turning Point USA. That's, I I think, the Charlie Kirk uh, semi-alt-right-ish weirdo uh, activist organization among among the youngsters, the kids these days. Um, Although I understand that this, this... a uh, particular young woman actually resigned from talking or turning point USA over some controversy or another uh, about the chapter in which she was involved at Kent state. But you've likely seen this now uh, young woman uh, walking around in her graduation photos with an AR 15 style rifle slung across her back and posing in her favorite dress, I guess or whatever she wore to graduation and with her graduation cap. And you know how kids, you know, make designs on top of the graduation caps these days. Back in my day, it used to be hire me or something like that. But people would write all sorts of weird messages up there. And she, she put the come and take it, uh, motif on her, on her graduation hat and took pictures of herself with the gun and making a big deal out of, uh, her, her message was now that, I uh, have graduated. I can, according to law in Ohio, walk on to the campus of my now alma mater, Kent State, ironically enough, with an assault rifle, although she would deny that it's an assault rifle, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, isn't that great? And when I was a student, I couldn't do it. But now that I'm a graduate and an adult, I can. And I'm not really sure why that's the case, and I'm sure it's a dumb law, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, she's making a very big deal of it and circulating her photos all over the internet. Uh, I, I probably inspired by that other one from, where was it, Kentucky, who had a, who said, I don't take normal graduation photos, and she had the pistol tucked in the front of her pants and was lifting her Women for Trump shirt, but but only, only to reveal the gun. I wasn't doing anything otherwise untoward, other than flashing a gun, which isn't really all that acceptable normally anyway. And so uh, this other one is walking around with a gun on her back and looking to engage in debate with people and uh, having moderate success engaging at the moment. Uh, uh, the, uh, Shan- uh, the account of, anyway, Shannon Watts over at Mom's Demand Moms Demand Action on Gun Safety. And uh, she is now mom-splaining, or rather, I guess I should say, as I did on Twitter, graduation photo-splaining motherhood to Shannon Watts. And I am guessing that young lady here is not a mother at the moment. And uh, I'm just sort of wondering how that fits into the worldview of if you don't have guns or understand guns, you're not allowed to talk about it. Because I find it hard to believe that she knows anything more about motherhood than a mother does. She'll likely learn eventually should she have children of her own. And it may not change her mind on the subject of firearms. I'm just saying, recent college graduate, not always really the kind of person I would rely on to explain motherhood to mothers. But hey... Your results may vary. Anyhow, now on to the news of the day, now that we've uh, chatted a little bit. Uh, 
Scott Pruitt. No. Okay. Well, Scott Pruitt also uh, in the news with like the 95th instance of his utter corruption. But clearly the story of the day, which can be approached from a number of different angles, uh, I would say originated last night with Ronan Farrow uh, reporting in New Yorker, I think, yes, uh, the, the biggest, latest bombshell on the Michael Cohen story. And there's, there's still more to come and still that we haven't, that we haven't, you know, sorted out from previous days, but we're going to have to jump ahead to this one. Ronan Farrow uh, published in the New Yorker yesterday and tweeted out his article with, uh, well, a, a comment that was of some interest to me yesterday. However, however, my laptop doesn't really want to show that to us right now. It's going to spin around and around in circles for a little while. Before Let's try backing out of it and then uh, bringing it up again. Here we go. So the tweet that caught my eye, uh, condensing the point of this, this longer article into uh, one quick grab here, the whistleblower who leaked Michael Cohen's financial records is stepping forward to say why. Now, uh, you may be up to speed with the story on Michael Cohen's financial records without even realizing, oh, yes, it must be that a whistleblower leaked something. How else did we find out? We, we know we heard the news from Michael Avenetti, but why does Michael Avenetti know that Novartis, AT&T, and others uh, were paying money to Michael Cohen and that he was depositing it in the same bank account, uh, Essential Consultants, LLC, that he was using to pay Stormy Daniels. Clearly, he knows about Essential Consultants. He knows about the fact that money from Essential Consultants, LLC, went to his client, Stormy Daniels. How does he know who else is writing checks to Essential Consultants? That wouldn't normally be something that he could just pull up on, on his radar. Someone must have told him who told him. And now we know there was a little bit of speculation over the last few days. And the speculation was, well, it was correct, as it turns out. It was that somebody in the financial industry with access to these suspicious activity reports must have tipped off Michael Avenetti. That is to say... Uh, you've likely heard in our coverage of money laundering issues in the past or uh, seen it on TV or in the movies or read about it in the newspaper that uh, certain suspicious financial transactions generate by law these suspicious activity reports. We might not have known what they were called or what, who generated them or where they were stored, but you had to have some idea, as we've mentioned in the past, things like transferring more than $10,000 for any reason among individuals often will generate one of these reports. And the suspicious activity reports, they hasten to stress as they report about these things, don't necessarily constitute evidence of any wrongdoing of any kind. It's just put a red flag on this thing and look into it. If it's just somebody who's got a bunch of money moving it from one account to another or from one account to another person and giving them some large amount of money, okay, fine. We'll investigate it. Good explanation. Put it away. We don't need it anymore. But for some reason, Michael Cohen has an awful lot of these things. And I imagine people who handle lots of money have lots of them. And it's just a matter of finding out whether or not there's a reasonable explanation for all of this suspicious activity. And uh, indeed, it turns out that someone with access to the uh, suspicious activity reports gave them over to Michael Avenetti or to some reporter who then passed them on to Michael Avenetti as well. And is that a problem? Does that sound like something that breaks a law somewhere along the line? Yes, it does sound like that. And, and it's true. It would be against the law for most people with access to those things to simply turn them over to reporters or attorneys or anybody at all. 
So why would you do such a thing? And that was what made his story so interesting. The whistleblower who leaked Michael Cohen's financial records is stepping forward to say why. Long story, which is a good story, short is records of bigger, potentially more sensitive swaths, I don't know if that's the word I would have used, of suspicious transactions appeared to be missing from a government database. And that's worthy of at least the dramatic music, I think. And uh, maybe one or two of the other familiars. That is not how this works! And that's true. That is not how that works. However, I'm glad we got it, and... Thank you, God! There you go. Okay, so, uh... Well, what the hell is it supposed to do, you moron? I don't know. There's no reason to get angry at me about it. I'm just going to read the, the story. I think this is what we're supposed to do. And the guys being... Something it'll be interesting. We'll be saying he's a hero because it kind of is, but he broke the law. Yes, he did. So, how can your hero be a lawbreaker? I don't know. Uh, and then somebody will say, And you people are always doing this. You thought Edward Snowden was a hero. And I will say, Wait a minute, not me. I didn't, but uh, I understand. I recognize some of the value of what he put out there, but don't blame me for hero and PS, by the way. Most people who point at you and say, you thought Edward Snowden was a hero. Well, like now you think Edward Snowden is a hero because he's gone to hide in Russia, which you now love, and was the, basically, you know, broke the dam open for operations like WikiLeaks as well. And uh, if you're a Trump supporter, you love WikiLeaks. All of a sudden, just like Sean Hannity, we forget among the other things that Sean Hannity has done wrong and the reasons he's such an idiot that he turned from an execute Snowden guy into a Snowden is a hero guy. Anyway, for those of us who are always sort of like, eh, I have mixed feelings about what Edward Snowden did. I think you're in the right place, you know, and depending on uh, which end of the mixed feelings you come out on. When it comes down to uh, if I gave you the power to decide whether he should be imprisoned or not, what would you say? Uh, that's where the differences lie. OK, so here's the New Yorker piece that Ronan Farrow produced. What is in the water at Ronan Farrow's place? He's, he's the, I don't know. Uh, but if he's on fire, as many people say he is, then maybe he has no water at all. And that was a terrible idea to explore metaphor-wise. Missing files motivated the leak of Michael Cohen's financial records. This will take us past the break and, you know, into the next century probably. But we're going to read it anyway because it's the news of the day, not, not the tornado thing or the elephant thing. A law enforcement official, yes, a law enforcement official, released the documents after finding that additional suspicious transactions did not appear in a government database. Depending on how you read that. Uh, the way you're supposed to read it is, hey, there are supposed to be records here and there aren't. Something fishy is going on and so therefore I need to do something. That's what the story will make clear. The other side is reading it and saying he released the documents because he found that there was no other evidence of any suspicious transactions in Michael Cohen's background. So he released this one so that he could paint him as a lawbreaker. It's a creative reading. I'll give him that. That's what's happening out in the world. Here we go. Last week, several news outlets obtained financial records showing that Michael Cohen, President Trump's personal attorney, and I have big doubts about that, had used a shell company, and it is a shell company, we explained that, to receive payments, and he did receive them, from various firms, and they are firm, okay, with business before the Trump administration. In the days since, there has been much speculation about who leaked the confidential documents and the Treasury Department's Inspector General has launched a probe to find the source. It's time to end this probe, by the way. It's been dragging on for hours. Okay, That source, a law enforcement official, is speaking publicly for the first time to the New Yorker. The New Yorker. New Yorker? Yes, the New Yorker, to explain the motivation. The official had grown alarmed after being unable to find, and here's how come you know that our reading of this situation is correct, after being unable to find two important reports on Cohen's financial activity in a government database. He knew that they should have been there, and they weren't. It's not that he searched for other evidence of wrongdoing and found none, but he knew of other wrongdoing and found that evidence that was by law either once filed there and he knew it or should have been filed there but wasn't for some reason, was no longer available. 
that was a problem. So, after being unable to find two important reports of Cohen's financial activity in a government database, the official worried that the information was being withheld from law enforcement and released the remaining documents. The payments to Cohen that have emerged in the past week came primarily from a single document, a suspicious activity report filed by First Republic Bank, where Cohen's shell company, Essential Consultants, LLC, maintained an account. The document detailed sums in the hundreds of thousands of dollars paid to Cohen by the pharmaceutical company Novartis, the telecommunications giant AT&T, largely responsible probably for those above-ground wires in the first place, you dumb bastards, and an investment firm with ties to the Russian oligarch Victor Vexelberg, all of which we have heard about in the last couple of days. The report also refers to two previous suspicious activity reports, or SARs, that the bank had filed, which documented even larger flows of questionable money into Cohen's account. The two reports detail more than $3 million in additional transactions, triple the amount in the report released last week. Which individuals or corporations were involved remains a mystery. But according to the official who leaked the report, these SARs, uh, I, I hesitate to call them SARS because of the disease, but these SARs were absent from the database maintained by the Treasury Department's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, or FinCEN. I don't know if they say that. FinCEN? FinCEN. The official who has spent a career in law enforcement, and, and he means his career in law enforcement, not just anybody's career in law enforcement, but the official who has spent a career in law enforcement uh, told me, Ronan Farrow, I have never seen something pulled off the system. That system is a safeguard for the bank. It's a stockpile of information. When something's not there that should be, I immediately become concerned. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for Kago in the Morning, interrupting this little break to say thanks so much to all of you who are contributing supporters of Kago in the Morning. Thousands of you are downloading the show each day, but fewer than 1 in 25 regular listeners are donating to help keep us on the air. For the money you'd spend on a single three-minute iTunes song, we bring you two hours of great news and entertainment every day, five days a week. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it easy. You can find us there by searching KGROX or David Waldman or KGRO in the Morning or even Daily Coast Radio in their search box, and you'll be right where you need to be to make easy, recurring, monthly contributions to support our show. Once again, thanks so much for your support. Welcome back now to the K-Girl in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. And we continue with the New Yorker reporting of Ronan Farrow uh, regarding the big bombshell of yesterday. But before I jump into that, I will uh, bring you up to date that uh, the, the latest on the young lady who graduated from Kent State. And yes, uh, she was fully aware of Kent State's prior history with firearms incidents. And a lot of people thought, oh, well, how ironic that you clearly weren't a history major. Uh, but, you know, she was aware of the Kent State incident. It was in her initial, the, one, the first one I saw anyway, of several tweets of pictures of her parading around with her, her gun on um, and, and saying, yeah, it's a good thing now you can carry weapons with you onto the campus of Kent State. Those who remember, you know, the tyrannical government uh, and what they did here know that it would make sense for students uh, to be able to carry firearms to, to, you know, to ward off the tyranny. I forget exactly how she put it, but it was basically intimating that uh, had this been the, the situation, then I would have fired back or perhaps preemptively fired at the National Guard troops. Uh, who killed the students here in 1970. But, hey, that doesn't sound like much of a plan to me. But remember, she knows everything there is to know about everything because she just graduated from college. So I'll tell you mothers how to be mothers. 
uh, her beef with Shannon Watts was, uh, don't you want, uh, what kind of mother doesn't want their children to be protected? And having guns protects you. And some people hear Yanni or Yanni when they say that and others hear Laurel and I can't really describe it, but <clears throat> that's, uh, that's for you to settle amongst yourselves. But I, I thought that was interesting. Yes, uh, she was going to uh, lay down suppressing fire to save all those students from the tyranny of the government way back when. I, I, of course, uh, quite honestly, if you actually just transported this person, this super conservative person to 1970, you know that that person would have been, you know, would have run over to the side of the National Guard troops and started firing at the other students. So... Eh, whatever. It was kind of a dumb thought to begin with. Okay. Let's see. Oh, by the way, Chief Beef Loco uh, taking an interest in the electric, the electricity uh, stunt murder that uh, Thomas Edison perpetrated against our poor elephant friend, uh, targeting ele uh, uh, elephant Americans early on is really unfortunate. Um, but yeah, it was uh, DC was what Edison was pitching. One of my kids came home the other day uh, talking about Thomas Edison and saying, uh, we learned today in history. I was, you know, uh, I, I, it made me proud to hear, you know, that they were giving at least good alternative information in the history class. So we came back and said, yeah, we learned, you know, about Thomas Edison, but we learned that he's kind of a fraud. Like one of his big things was stealing other people's inventions and claiming them as their own or, or elbowing his way into a field which had already been opened by some other inventor and, you know, using his fame after he had it to leverage recognition for his version of the invention and gaining credit for it. So uh, the first inventor to... I guess, uh, come to understand the power of lobbying and public relations for grabbing credit. So, you know, he invented that. <laughs> Maybe we can credit him for that. Uh, of course, you know, if, if this show were more popular, Fox and Friends or Breitbart or somebody like that would grab the clip from that and run around and fake outrage that uh, liberal radio host says he's proud that his children learned that Thomas Edison was a fraud. Well, uh, let me revise that. I don't actually give a crap one way or the other, but it was interesting. <laughs> there, how's that? Uh, I, I wouldn't say it really rose to the level of, of pride. Uh, good question, Bill, asking, what is the sentence for killing a National Guard member? Uh, and it's usually ready, aim, fire, I think is the sentence they use before killing National Guard members um, and vice versa. But I imagine, yeah, you'd probably go to prison too and maybe it's treason so i don't know uh, it's waging war against somebody anyway uh even if it would have been a good shot at the time i guess here's a, the, the more relevant question is what is the sentence or would there even be a sentence for a right-wing loon to run around behind the national guard troops and say i want to kill hippies too and and doing that that's that's problematic you would think Perhaps not. Anyway, uh, back to the other story here. Uh, the New Yorkers reporting, thanks to Ronan Farrow, on the financial uh, law enforcement officer who turned over the information that gave, that made it possible for Michael Avenetti to give us that sneak preview that opened up a door into Michael Cohen's financial world that has landed him in probably the hottest water so far. Where we left off was that uh, this officer found reports that were referenced in the suspicious activity report that alerted us all to the money from AT&T and Victor Vexelberg and Novartis. It referenced two earlier reports that covered a different period of time and entailed some $3 million in transactions that were somehow now missing from the database. And as he said in explaining why he turned these, this, why he leaked this paperwork, I've never seen something pulled off the system. 
That system is a safeguard for the bank. It's a stockpile of information. When something's not there that should be, I immediately became concerned. The official added, that's why I came forward. Well, that's his pretty concise explanation. Seven former government officials and other experts familiar with the Treasury Department's FinCEN database. Again, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. Fine, financial, F-I-N, CEN, Crimes Enforcement Network. Uh, seven other officials familiar with this database expressed varying levels of concerns about the missing reports. Some speculated that FinCEN may have restricted access to the reports due to the sensitivity of their content, which they said would be nearly unprecedented, but it is something to keep in mind. And that's the argument that skeptics, whether they are pro-Trump skeptics or not, are throwing out there the possibility that uh, the FBI or some other authority said these reports are too hot to handle. But then again, that raises the question, why leave that other one out there? And there are only a few explanations for why that may have happened. Sloppiness. Um, these may have been pulled over a period of time and the official initially responsible for hiding, you know, making the decision to hide the first two decided differently about the third one. For some reason, it was speculated, for instance, that the bulk of the money in the first two appear very obviously uh, linkable to the Trump Russia investigation, whereas this third report minus the possible linkage to Victor Vexelberg was mostly non-Russian in nature. And so they decided to minimize the number of SARs, which they were going to hide from the public, possibly an explanation, but though people were debating whether or not Mueller or those involved in his investigation are more thorough than that and would simply say hide them all or hide none of them or, you know, and the, the, the pushback. Oh, there was also the possibility that it had been done through other than official channels by people with access to do it, perhaps, but without any legal justification or going through the normal process. It would, and it would be an abnormal process, of course, whatever process there is in place that would permit through official channels removing SAR from the database and uh, in so doing succeeded in getting the first two much more incriminating and earlier filed SARs removed from the database before being found out or otherwise uh, terminated or transferred or what have you and never got around to the third one or just wasn't in place when the third one was filed. There are a number of speculative explanations for why two would have been eliminated, but not the third. None of them are terribly satisfactory, but something weird is happening. So the seven former government officials said uh, this could be something or it could be nothing. Some speculated that they, right, they, they have restricted access due to the sensitivity of the content, uh, one called the possibility explosive. Uh, now, others, I guess, had different things to say about it. A record retention policy of FinCEN's website on FinCEN's website notes that false documents are those, quote, deemed highly sensitive and requiring strict limitations on access may be transferred out of its master file. So that is out there. Nevertheless, a former prosecutor who spent years working with the FinCEN database said that she knew of no mechanism for restricting access to SARs. So it's entirely possible that you could have the caveat out there that, well, it could be we reserve the right to transfer these files out of the master file, but we've never done it. So we've never actually nailed down what the process is, or we've done it on an ad hoc basis every time. Or whatever. So, so, you know, maybe, or it may just be that I've, this person out of the seven says, I've never been involved in any situation wherein uh, documents were removed. So it's highly unusual, in my opinion. So, all of which is uh, equally plausible, I think. 
Uh, so as we said, she speculated that FinCEN may have taken the extraordinary step of restricting access because of the highly sensitive nature of a potential investigation. It may be that someone reached out to FinCEN to ask to limit disclosure of certain SARs related to an investigation. Whether that person who reached out was the special counsel or related to the special counsel or from the Southern District of New York, uh, the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office there. Uh, the special counsel, by the way, he adds parenthetically, is investigating Russian interference, as you know, in the 2016 presidential election. The Southern District of New York is investigating Cohen and the FBI raided his office and hotel room last month. Okay, so it could have been Mueller's office. It could have been the Southern District of New York. It could have been someone else. And that's the one that's got everybody worried. Whatever the explanation, though, for the missing reports, the appearance that some but not all had been removed or restricted troubled the official who released the report last week. Why just those two missing? The official who feared that the contents of those two reports might be permanently withheld said, that's what alarms me the most. FinCEN said in a statement that it protects the confidentiality of SARs in order to protect both filers and potentially named individuals. The statement added, FinCEN neither confirms nor denies the existence of purported SARs. Spokespeople for the special counsel's office and the Southern District of New York declined to comment. Michael Cohen and his lawyer also did not respond to requests for comment. Banks are legally mandated to file suspicious activity reports with the government in order to call attention to activity that resembles money laundering, fraud, and any other criminal conduct. These reports are routed to a permanent database, it's not that permanent apparently, maintained by FinCEN, which can be searched by tens of thousands of law enforcement and other federal government personnel. The reports are a routine response to any financial activity that appears suspicious. They are not proof of criminal activity and often do not result in criminal charges, though the information of them in them can be used in law enforcement proceedings. This is a permanent record. They should be there, the official who described an exhaustive search for the reports said. And there's nothing there. So this gaping hole where these other two reports that are referenced in the third one should be. And uh, I guess uh, in addition to all the speculation of, well, maybe Mueller's office or maybe the Southern District of New York asked for them to be withdrawn from the database so that sensitive information that they plan to use in furthering their respective investigations doesn't come to light and damage the investigation in some way. The other thing that probably occurred to people is it's the Treasury's database. Can Donald Trump say, hey, Steve Mnuchin, I want those things erased or I want them pulled from the database anyway, because pretty soon some enterprising reporter is going to find a way to get their hands on that. And then the case gets blown wide open. Why not move the third one? I don't know. That's a bad, that's a tough one to understand. Unless, like as we said, it was somebody else who said, listen, I want all the evidence of Michael Cohen's wrongdoing removed from the FinCEN database. And that person was on hand to take care of the first two reports and was either on vacation or fired or, I don't know, sold into slavery in Russia. I got no idea. Uh, before the third one was filed and nobody picked up the slack for that person when they were gone. They are that sloppy. Anyway... Continuing again, Cohen set up the First Republic account, remember, First Republic Bank, for essential consultants in October of 2016, shortly before the presidential election, in order to pay the adult film actress Stephanie Clifford, who performs under the name of Stormy Daniels, $130,000 in return for signing a non-disclosure agreement about her alleged affair with Donald Trump. It's very carefully constructed. First Republic's compliance officers later began flagging Cohen's transactions in the account as possible signs of money laundering. Among other potential violations, the documents cite suspicion concerning the source of funds. 
suspicious EFT slash wire transfers, suspicious use of multiple accounts, and transaction with no apparent economic, business, or lawful purpose. That's some catch-all, isn't it? A spokesperson for First Republic Bank, of course, declined to comment. By January of this year, First Republic had filed three suspicious activity reports about Cohen's account. The most recent report, the only one made public so far, examined Cohen's transactions from September of 2017 to January of 2018 and included activity totaling almost a million dollars. It alludes to the two previous reports that the official could not find in the FinCEN database. The first report that the official was unable to locate, which covered almost seven months, appeared to have listed a little over a million dollars in activity. The second report that the official was unable to locate, which investigated a three-month period between June and September of 2017. I guess ordinarily they're filed quarterly, perhaps? I don't know. The second report that the official was unable to locate, which investigated a three-month period between June and September 2017, found suspect transfers totaling more than $2 million. So that's quite a bit of time. From, uh, let's see, the first report, seven months. Oh, it doesn't say which seven months. Hmm. Okay. A, I guess we can figure it out because there haven't been that many months of the Trump administration. So let's see. One, one, the latest report is September 2017 to January 2018. The second report that they were unable to find was from June to September. So they have, so that, that covers June 2017 to January 2018. And then seven months was in the first report. And I assume that is uh, counting backwards from June, what, May, April, March, February, January is five months, December, November. So from the election, election day 2016 through June 2017 is seven months and... There's a million dollars, a little more than a million dollars moving in and out of Essential Consultants, LLC. Prior to that, what did they say? that uh, When was it established? Four months before? Uh, oh, established in October 2016. So really one month. So uh, first set up in October of 2016. Then I guess $130,000 somehow comes in and gets paid out later on to Stormy Daniels, and then these reports start to catch this activity. Why so much money moving in and out of this tiny consultancy that doesn't have anybody in it? It's a shell company. What's going on? All right. So a substantial portion of this money seems to have ended up in Cohen's personal accounts. Morgan Stanley Smith Barney filed a separate SAR showing that during the same three-month period, and I guess this is the June to September 2017 period, Cohen set up two accounts with the firm, Morgan Stanley, into which he deposited three checks from Essential Consultants, his Essential Consultants account, two in the amount of $250,000, and one in the amount of $505,000. So a million dollars gets in checks, three, three checks totaling a million dollars sent from essential consultants to a Morgan Stanley Smith Barney account established uh, personally by Cohen. Morgan Stanley Smith Barney marked those transactions, which added up to more than a million dollars, as possible signs of, quote, bribery or gratuity and, quote, suspicious use of third-party transactors, parentheses, straw man, unquote. In other words, a guy just showed up with a million dollars from some LLC and opens up a Smith Barney account, Morgan Stanley Smith Barney account, and uh, they say, why would this happen? Who is Michael Cohen? How could he have a million dollars lying around when he had to supposedly, they didn't know this yet, take out a home equity loan to pay 
the $130,000 to Stormy Daniels. That's sounding a lot dumber as an excuse these days, isn't it? Cohen appears to have misled First Republic repeatedly regarding the purpose of the essential consultants account. That's why I guess they first began filing these SARs on him. That's a big deal, apparently. In paperwork filed with the bank, if you've opened an account, you've probably filed such paperwork. You just didn't go and give people reason to believe that you were up to something illegal afterwards. You know, but you forget about these things because you're not doing anything illegal. That they ask you when you set up an account, say, what kind of business is this? What, What sort of line of work are you in? In paperwork filed with the bank, Cohen said that the company would be devoted to using, quote, his experience in real estate to consult on commercial and residential, unquote, deals. So again, this is paperwork that he files, I guess, when he opens the account. That would be October of 2016. And at that point, that sounds like a plausible explanation. Donald Trump's attorney, and everybody knows what a joke that was even then, but wasn't quite as clear of uh, 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 what a horrible attorney he is and how corrupt he was, even if they knew that Donald Trump was terribly corrupt. Although we knew that he was a bad guy. He was, of course, threatening people. He was making, he was the one at the time, I guess he first came to everyone's notice when he was the guy who said, uh, oh, these allegations that Donald Trump raped uh, Ivan- Ivana, not Ivanka, but Ivana Trump, his first wife, uh, that she makes in her books, that's all garbage. And besides which, you can't rape your wife. That's not possible, legally speaking. And it was like, wow, it's really been a long time since that was the case. Though, good point, it once was the case, and we should discuss that at some point, but not relevant really for this purposes, these purposes. But uh, And he also was the guy who threatened the Daily Beast. What I'm going to do to you is effing disgusting. You remember that whole guy? And of course, the says who confrontation as well. We knew he was a jackass. Anyway, he tells First Republic Bank, yes, this essential consultants LLC account is for me to make money consulting on real estate deals, which was, I think, a reasonable expectation of how he might be making money in the future. Because for whatever reason, the fakery of uh, The Apprentice had turned us into believers, collectively speaking anyway, that Donald Trump was a genius businessman and had made billions of dollars in real estate. And with our belief that uh, Michael Cohen was his attorney, we thought there was some reasonable chance that Michael Cohen knew how to generate big fees consulting on real estate deals. Certainly, that's what Sean Hannity thought when he asked him for advice on his real estate dealings. So we have that. Cohen told the bank that his transactions would be modest and based within the United States. In fact, the compliance officers wrote, quote, a significant portion of the target account deposits continue to originate from entities that have no apparent connection to real estate or apparent need to engage Cohen as a real estate consultant. And we've only seen the reports of, like, why would AT&T, why would Novartis, why would... This other firm, uh, Columbus Nova, need millions of dollars worth of real estate advice from Michael Cohen. There is no real reason for this. So either he's getting money for some other reason or, you know, we, we just need to know what the hell's going on here. This seems suspicious to us. What does Stormy Daniels, for instance, know about real estate transactions? Why $130,000 to her? But more to the point, why a million dollars from Novartis? Why from AT&T? Who's using, who at AT&T is using Michael Cohen to consult on real estate deals? And these sums are not modest. And at least when it comes to, I guess, Columbus Nova, some question as to whether or not they originate in the United States. David Murray Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. I missed a sentence here, I think. Likewise, a significant portion of the deposits continues to be derived from foreign entities, in addition to not coming from people who would need Cohen as a real estate consultant. They're coming from foreign entities. David Murray, a former Treasury official focused on illicit finance, told me there are a ton of red flags here. The pattern of activity has indicators that are inherently suspicious and the volume and source of funds do not match the account profile that was built 
when the account was opened. If you're going to be stealing millions of dollars from foreign entities, you're supposed to say so up front. I could be getting huge influxes of rubles for illicit purposes that have nothing to do with whatever business I thought to tell you I was running out of this account. Oh, okay. Of course, that will generate its own suspicious activity report, but at least you haven't lied. The report released last week highlights a payment from Cohen's account to Demeter Direct Incorporated, Demeter, D-E-M-E-T-E-R, in publicly filed paperwork. Demeter Direct represents itself as a Korean food company. Hmm. So real estate consulting for a Korean food company, which is it's ridiculous sounding. But I guess even with AT&T, Novartis like, well, we want a new corporate campus. Can you help us consult on real estate for that? There's a plausible explanation, but you raise a question with an SAR and can you investigate it and dismiss it later on? Sure. Fine. OK, go ahead. Do it. Now a Korean food company wants to put a million dollars or whatever into Cohen's Essential Consultants account. So, uh, a website since taken down suggested that Demeter Direct was not a Korean food company, but rather a global consulting firm. After the press began scrutinizing Cohen's accounts, a man listed as Demeter Direct's CEO, Mark Ko, K-O, told CNN, that he served as an intermediary and translator in Cohen's dealings with an aviation firm, majority owned by South Korea's government, called Korea Aerospace Industries. Now, that's a name that actually rings a bell, and that came up in the, uh, I, I guess, at some point in, some per in the periphery of the information about uh, the first set of transactions, the first couple of companies that we heard were paying Michael Cohen, right? According to the First Republic report, the aerospace company paid Cohen $150,000 in November of 2017, the same month President Trump visited South Korea. Hmm. At the time, the company was lobbying for a controversial multi-billion dollar contract with the U.S. Air Force. More after this. Welcome back to the Kegger in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. I uh, forgot that I have my handy-dandy one-minute break button and went to the two-minute break instead out of habit. So bear with me for a second. And uh, i got to figure out some way of rigging these things up so that uh, there's no mistakes made because, uh, I don't know, I hate mistakes. Don't you? Yeah, well, at any rate, uh, we'll see if we can't make that happen better in the future. Uh, by the way, questions coming in from the warlock and you got to pay attention to the questions that come in uh he had asked do democrats have bad lawyers too sure everyone in the world has equal opportunity to find bad lawyers it's just a matter of whether or not you land twice on some of the worst lawyers in the world michael cohen i think is a serious contender for literally the worst lawyer in the world. He's only barely a lawyer. And it's not just because he also happened to go to what was objectively ranked as the worst law school in America and lost its accreditation. And I, there have been other uh, law schools that have lost their accreditation along the way. But his is uh, particularly bad. And I did get an objecting notice today earlier, too. You know, I had some friends who went to that law school, and they're nice people, and I'm sure they are. And they may even be good lawyers, because somebody's got to be at the top of that class. And even though it's not a very good law school or not widely regarded as a good law school, uh, you can be a good law student and come from a terrible law school. It's true. It's just that there's overwhelming evidence that Michael Cohen is effing horrible. Now... The biggest beneficiary of Michael Cohen being horrible, besides us, the public, finding things out that we should never have found out, had a competent attorney handled things. The other, the second biggest beneficiary is Rudy Giuliani, who would otherwise perhaps be in contention for worst lawyer in the world because he keeps going on television and saying, my client loves collusion. I don't understand why everybody asks this question. I, th I thought I answered it uh, appropriately last time. 
He totally colluded with the Russians. Why are you asking me again? Oh, uh, you're supposed to be defending him against collusion. You normally wouldn't expect the defense attorney to say, oh, the, that's true. But did I say that? Yeah, you did. Hmm. Well, that's a cause for concern, I guess. But I'll come back later. I'll have me back tomorrow and we'll discuss how concerning it is. He's doing dumb stuff. It doesn't make any real sense. Uh, and I suppose you could say he's, you know, uh, fogging up the picture even further by artificially generating additional controversies. But they're real controversies based on real facts that show that real collusion happened. And that's not really good for your client. They're, they're getting towards something. And uh, now would be a good time to, to point to it, perhaps. Judd Legum pointed it out yesterday in a tweet that just happens to have gone by on my screen just now. As a matter of fact, retweeted by someone else saying, uh, this is really something. Uh, Trump's legal team, and that would include Giuliani, is taking the idea that a sitting president can't be indicted. And this relies on old uh, Office of Legal Counsel memos, some of which probably should be re-examined and should have been re-examined uh, even before Trump ran for president. But uh, traditionally speaking, yes, it's been the OLC position and, and others uh, that a sitting president isn't to be indicted because it really is uh, an imposition on his ability to function as the chief well, chief executive officer and chief, you know, national security officer for the United States. And it can be a distraction. And I think that, by the way, uh, that doctrine was developed. Well, I don't know. I was going to say, I think it was developed in an atmosphere wherein it was not necessarily contemplated that the indictable activity was intrinsically designed to compromise his ability, the president's ability to function as a national security officer in the first place. Although I guess that's arguable given that it probably grew out of the Nixon situation. But Nixon was involved, well, chiefly, uh, in the end, what ended up sinking him was his involvement in criminal activity designed to yield domestic political gain. And that's problematic because, of course, it's domestic political gain that grants him the prerogative to conduct foreign policy and war fighting on behalf of the United States, which he was also doing illegally. But I guess you know, the thinnest of reads to, to cling to there to save that theory is that, uh, OK, well, it wasn't the same intrinsically the same activity that he was engaged in. Whereas with Donald Trump, it was like, well, from the beginning, he had no interest in actually conducting the affairs in a way that would protect the national security of the United States of America. He was going to be engaged by foreign governments to weaken the national security of America, whether he knew it or not. And uh, his activity was so intimately tied up, therefore, in weakening the national security of America, that distracting him from that task is actually probably, arguably, inherently to the benefit of the national security. So, okay, we have that problem. That probably wasn't uh, contemplated up front. But also the much better logical uh, argument that if a president is really literally to be held exempt from indictment no matter what at all times while sitting as president because the argument goes uh, the constitution outlines how you handle a criminal president you make him no longer a president by impeaching him and then indict him if your argument is that a sitting president is literally constitutionally unindictable no matter what then you have to start asking yourself questions like, suppose he murders everybody in Congress on television and we see him do it and then he admits to it. What do you do? Like say, well, well, first of all, the Congress is dead and they can't impeach him. But suppose it's someone else and the Congress declines to impeach him because of partisan politics or whatever. 
I mean, is it really the case that you can uh, protect yourself from any and all overt crimes simply because you're the president of the United States? Or is it really the case that if it gets crazy at some point and crosses a line, then you really can actually, you know, indict a sitting president. But uh, Judd Legum notes what they're actually doing with the argument right now, since the president hasn't yet murdered the entire Congress. What they're doing with this is saying Trump's legal team is taking the idea that a sitting president can't be indicted for a crime to mean that the president therefore cannot commit a crime. That is, it's not illegal if the president does it. If it was illegal, you could be indicted for it, is the argument. But he can't be indicted, so therefore it must not be illegal. The idea that a sitting president can't be indicted is being conflated with the idea that a president cannot commit a crime. And therefore, if the president cannot commit a crime, the president cannot be investigated for a crime because you can't invest, you can't conduct a criminal investigation against someone who's literally legally and constitutional incapable of committing a crime. And you know he can't commit a crime because you can't indict him for it. That's how you define someone has committed a crime. Yeah, how do you know they committed a crime? I indicted him for it. That's how, that's how the law declares a crime to have been committed. Well, not really, but it's an interesting thought. It's just not a particularly good way of running a judicial system, let alone keeping checks and balances on the executive branch. But a good point, and uh, you should be on the lookout for it. That's the and, and by the way, that's called a slippery slope. If they can convince you that the fact that a president can't be indicted, one, if they can convince you that that's simply a fact because there's been a memo that says under ordinary circumstances or the very narrow circumstances we're currently presented with back in the Nixon era, back in the Clinton era, if there's a memo that says the president, this one, can't be indicted, one, it means all presidents can't, and two, it also means that no matter what the crime and the circumstances the same result obtains, that's ordinarily not to be countenanced in a, a legal system like ours that, that, that is based on analysis, based on facts and logic and deductive reasoning. Each individual, every case is distinguishable on something. If it's not, then you're talking about the same case and you don't have a problem. But yeah, the idea that, uh, well, uh, a memo says all presidents can't be indicted ever doesn't actually mean that there therefore cannot be crimes committed by a president. It's clear that presidents can commit crimes. That is in the Constitution, where it tells you that a president can be impeached or any uh, government official can be impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors. How does a president, and that is in, obviously included in any officers, there's no doubt constitutionally in anyone's mind here today, right, that presidents can be impeached, that presidents of the United States are subject to the impeachment power. I think we've settled that, right? We've done it twice. We've threatened it even more than that. So if a president can be in, impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors, then it can't possibly be the case that a president is constitutionally uh, immune from being charged with any criminal activity, right? Yeah. Now, that may be a different thing from indicting him because the impeachment process exists. You can't, you know, you can't in the first instance go to indictment is the argument, but see how much further they're taking it. If you can't indict him, then that means it isn't a crime. Well, that is obviously false on its face or else there wouldn't be mention of crimes committed by any federal officer, including the president, in the Constitution. And then they take it a step further. If it can't be a crime, then there would be no reason to investigate it. And even that is stupid. Did you take these cookies? No. Well... I'm going to investigate to see whether you did or not. And your child says, look, is it a crime? They were in our house. They were the property of the family. I, 
without admitting one way or the other whether I took them or not. No crime exists here. You have no right to investigate how the cookies disappeared. You would not accept that from your six-year-old, although you might be amazed. Or maybe it's, uh, what's his name's, uh, four-year-old, uh, and apparently one of the uh, conservative wackos out there is sure that they have a very precocious four-year-old that explains all social policy and undermines the social justice warriors and snowflakes all around the world. Maybe you have a similar kid, but that doesn't work. It doesn't go from, it doesn't follow from A to B, much less from B to C, but uh, they will be out there arguing it nonetheless. Let's see. Uh, Warlock says, no, it is not settled that Trump can be impeached. Uh, uh, and I guess you mean that in the sense that it's not settled that you could get a majority of the House of Representatives to impeach him, or are you, I mean, it may be that there are Trump supporters out there arguing that the Constitution doesn't apply to Donald Trump, or it's been misunderstood for the past 200 years. But other than that, uh, I think it's pretty well settled that the impeachment power exists and it covers the pres office of the President of the United States regardless of whether you think Donald Trump ought to be sitting in that uh, office or not. So um, it does seem a reasonable point if Trump cannot be indicted. What does? Uh, it's, a it, it's, it's not a reasonable point to say because you can't be indicted, no crime exists. You could, of course, commit a crime and have accomplices and one person can be indicted but isn't and is an unindicted co-conspirator and nonetheless the crime exists despite the fact that someone might be for one reason or another immune from or simply get a pass on indictment that doesn't obviate the crime. It's actually a terrible point across the board. That's the problem with it. And, uh, you know, that people are clinging to it is embarrassing and also wrong, though not my main point. But uh, I thought a much better point made by Judd Legum just to point out what the argument is. And uh, I'll do the work of pointing out precisely why each link in the chain is itself horrible and unworthy of discussion. Uh, it's never unworthy of discussion. It's always fun to point out exactly where the weak links in these things are. And there are many. So when we last left off to the great annoyance of some uh, portion of the audience who has grown overly frustrated with my diversions, and I'm sorry, I apologize. This is also very interesting stuff to me. We left off when Demeter Direct, we found out about the uh, billing itself as a Korean food company, but in some instances on now defunct websites defining itself instead as a global consulting firm paid money at some point to Cohen and Mark Coe, the Demeter Direct CEO, told CNN that he served as an intermediary and translator in Cohen's dealings with the aviation firm Korea Airspace Industries, a government-owned operation based in South Korea, and that the First Republic report says, the SAR report, that the aerospace company Korea Aerospace Industries once paid Cohen $150,000 coinciding with a trip by President Trump to South Korea while Korea Aerospace Industries was looking for a multi-billion dollar contract with the U.S. Air Force. What does that have to do with Demeter Direct? Once again, the link is Mark Ko, CEO of Demeter Direct, who says he served as an intermediary and translator in Cohen's dealings with Korea Airspace Industries. Why does the food company CEO do the translation for Michael Cohen's dealings with Korea Airspace Industries? Don't know. Why is Michael Cohen talking to Korea Aerospace Industries at all? Don't know. Why did Korea Aerospace Industries decide that the time to pay a consultant for whatever insight into Donald Trump is the same month that Donald Trump is in South Korea and they're looking to win a controversial multi-billion dollar contract with the U.S. Air Force. Don't know. Why would the U.S. Air Force be contracting with South Korean manufacturers for presumably 
national security, national defense related procurement? Don't really know. They are an ally, but don't you think we ought to be making that stuff in the United States of America? Probably. Different question. But the report also shows how Cohen apparently used the essential consultant's account for personal expenses. And again, I said that Mark, uh, Michael Cohen was the worst lawyer in the world, and this is the big problem here. Essential Consultants is established in October of 2016, and the initial purpose is to, f to receive and then send out money that was going to be used to pay Stormy Daniels. Now, once you do that, <laughs> I consider, really, once you, you've fulfilled the, the, the initial purpose of an LLC, your LLC is, to my mind, tainted, even if you've done nothing illegal with it. The, the purpose of LLCs, again, it stands for Limited Liability Corporation. You use them to limit your liability. Once you decide that this is the shell company that I'm going to use to pay Stormy Daniels and maybe other women who had relationships with, you know, had sex with Donald Trump. And by the way, there's breaking news on that front as well that Kate Charles uh, shared with us earlier in the show, and I didn't note it, but I've seen it all over Twitter. Uh, Michael Avenetti says this morning on television that he is in discussions vetting the stories of two more new different women who claim that they too were subject to non-disclosure agreements with payoffs to stay quiet about sexual encounters with Donald Trump. So, okay, that's in the news too. Uh, but once you decide you're going to use this account for paying women to be quiet about sexual affairs and let's say you realize the same day or later on same hour you know what else i could do to make a lot of money and, and i mean i'm not making any money here but i could make a lot of money consulting quote unquote consulting with big deep pocketed individuals and in industries who want to get an insight into whether it be real estate or donald trump's brain or either you know, some other worthless investment like bitcoin i don't know uh I, I, I need an account in which to deposit their massive, surely massive checks. Start another LLC because there's no point in intermingling these funds. It doesn't make any sense and it flies in the face of limited liability all by itself. I mean, it's just a dumb thing to do. And like I said, it's, 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 it's what makes him the worst lawyer in the world contender. Uh, the, the whole problem with this story, as somebody tweeted last night, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to believe that this all started with this stupid payoff to Stormy Daniels and that has spun out of control into a giant international incident that brings in the president and, uh, you know, uh, international global businesses. It was Justin Miller, uh, whose tweet I grabbed. He's the national editor of the Daily Beast and tweeting, what began as a six-figure payment to a porn star has exploded into an international multi-million dollar financial scandal. And uh, then, of course, linked to the Daily Beast's article on that subject. And it occurred to me to repeat once again, as I said the other day, this is all blown up into a giant incident because Trump's lawyer, and it's not really his lawyer, Michael Cohen, Alan Garten is his lawyer. Trump's lawyer was too dumb or too lazy to just form another LLC. Again, Trump's real lawyers, the Alan Gartens and others, they hardly do anything else all day long other than start new LLCs for discrete parts of Trump's stupid business. But not Michael Cohen. No. Like I said, over on the Trump organization side of things, if Donald Trump owns five units in, you know, there's five units left unsold in Trump Tower, and he wants to sell those off at some point, uh, or he owned them and now it's time to get rid of them, or he grants them to his kids for them to sell off for cash, whatever it is, he's got LLCs that are like, are called, uh, 
TT2205, meaning Trump Tower Unit 2205, whatever the unit number is. It's literally named like that, LLC. TT2205 LLC, Trump Tower Unit 2205 LLC, the purpose of which is to market, sell, and collect payment for Trump Tower Unit 2205 and nothing else. Totally legitimate way of doing things, and it's used to limit your liability. If you have Unit 2205 and 2206 are for sale, you form an LLC, that's TT2205 LLC, and another one called TT2206 LLC. Why? Suppose there's something wrong with the plumbing in 2205. You sell both units. Maybe you sell both units to the same person, even, but it doesn't matter, right? And the person who buys 2205 says, I'm going to sue you because the plumbing's bad. Okay, whatever. That happens a lot. So you sue, right? And then you realize the, the, the person who's suing you is like, this is my big payday. I'm going to sue Donald Trump. Deep pockets. He's one of these people who believes he's a good businessman and has billions of dollars. He doesn't. And you soon find that out. And then you say, God. Uh, well, I need to attach some more of his assets. He owns a lot of stuff. He owns a golf course. I'll make him sell the golf course and give me the cash from that. No, I'm sorry. You can't do that. You bought this unit not from Donald Trump, but from TT2205 LLC. And the only assets of TT2205 LLC were that unit. And they sold it to you. There is now no money for you to sue for. Now, unless you can prove that there was something fraudulent about the establishment of that LLC and the transfer of assets to that LLC, you're stuck. There's no money available for you. You can sue all day long. Even if you win, you won't get any money because you did business with TT2205 LLC, not Donald Trump, and not even TT2206 LLC, even if you bought both units. You're stuck. Sorry. It's actually smart practice. Why Michael Cohen decides, I have, and uh, first of all, he decides right initially in October of 2016, oh, I have to pay off Stormy Daniels and somebody's going to have to give me money to do that and I'm going to use that to write the check. All right, fine. I'll start an LLC that has, you know, mystery about it. Nobody knows what it is. It's anonymous. We'll do it in Delaware and I'll use it for that purpose. And that way, there's no check that says Donald, Tr Donald J. Trump Foundation to Stormy Daniels. There's no check that says Michael D. Cohen to Stormy Daniels. It just says Essential Consultants LLC to Stormy Daniels. And even if the copy of the check comes out, everybody says, what's Essential Consultants LLC? And maybe they never find out. Maybe they never do the research. Maybe nobody cares. Who cares why a porn star is getting $130,000. I hope it's for porn, right? But you, you know, if you get a tip, you would go and check it out. But otherwise, you'd never know. Fine. He actually did the footwork on that one. Then he finds out he can get a million dollars from AT&T and the like. And why no second LLC? Mike's Consulting LLC. Michael D. Cohen's Totally Not Paying Porn Stars Account LLC. Legitimate businessman, LLC, anything would have done the trick, but he doesn't do it. And I can't figure out why, other than he's literally the worst lawyer in the world. There's no reason not to have a second LLC. Michael Cohen probably has a dozen. Why he decides that AT&T, Novartis, uh, and, you know, uh, Russian oligarchs and who knows who else should be paying into that same thing. Just get another post office box. Why are they aren't paying you directly? I don't know. Why use Essential Consultants LLC? Did you want to get caught? Why open a Smith Barney account with checks from Essential Consultants LLC? He doesn't put any of his taxi medallion money in there. All of this blows up because look, people say, ooh, sex story, let's investigate. Fine, it's going to happen. So they investigate. Oh, the check is from Essential Consultants LLC. Let's let's go to Delaware and try and track it down. Oh, look, there we go. Michael Cohen. Amazing. Blockbuster story. Story ends there. You know, I mean, there's the lawsuit and Michael Avenetti does his best to keep it in the news and everything. But you <laughs> add money from Novartis, add money from AT&T, Korea Aerospace, Victor Vexelberg. You're going to have a 
problem on your hands very, very shortly, and you're not going to like it. And it all could have been avoided if all you did was isolate the sex money and essential consultants. Damn, that was a good name, though, and I wasted it on the sex bribe money. Uh, Agreed. Essential Consultants 2 LLC would have done the trick, quite honestly. And uh, why you didn't use it, I have no idea. I, 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 I couldn't tell you. All right. Well, let's see. My music is late and coming in. Uh, one of the weird things about this... Uh, why is this not going? This is bad news. Uh, all right. Let's eliminate that. Hit that. And uh, try this again. There we go. For some reason, the music is super late. But I'm going to leave and come back after this. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Okay, well, to match the extra long uh, or the extra long delay in bringing the music online, which I finally figured out, uh, we also have a malfunctioning mute button on the microphone once again, which uh, worries me, and I guess it's probably about time to replace this thing and make sure that it doesn't uh, crap out on me entirely without another one on hand so we don't miss any shows. But uh, what a day it has been for the special effects here. And now the music is back because I faded it all the way out and uh, then lifted my finger to go click the off button and my magic mouse from uh, Apple here uh, registered that as, no, that's an upward flick of the finger and so therefore the volume should be turned back up again. I'm having a great day with the Apple products today. All right. So uh, meanwhile, we've stuck on this one topic and we haven't gotten all the way through the Ronan Farrow situation, but I think we've... I think at this point adequately explained uh, why it is that uh, Michael Cohen is the worst lawyer in the world. And uh, I'm not really sure uh, if there was more to explain about that one, except that he's just extraordinarily lazy and declined, declined for some reason to uh, take advantage of the benefits of LLCs to limit his liability and limit the ability of investigative reporters or uh, investi- uh, you know, attorneys that uh, oppose him in litigation <clears throat> to root out the rest of his business interests. There's no reason that he should have commingled all that money. So uh, where were we? Let's see. We talked about Demeter Direct and Korea Airspace Industries. Then the report also shows how Cohen apparently used the essential consultants account for personal expenses. Another huge mistake. He seems to have used it to pay his American Express bill, uh, as well as his AT&T bill. Not, and it's funny, too, right? Why didn't he negotiate? If you're going to be paying me a million dollars, why don't you not collect my bill? Give me free phone service. Well, it's not really necessarily a benefit worth negotiating about. But uh, money coming into and going out of the AT&T accounts payable ledger there. But using essential consultants to pay his American Express bill, his AT&T bill, and his Mercedes-Benz bills. I guess that means he was uh, leasing or perhaps had bought a car from a Mercedes-Benz dealership and was making his payments with essential consultants checks, marking account numbers on the memo lines of his checks. So he's very carefully handwriting all of these checks. This is how he pays his expenses out of essential consultants, LLC. Another, like, basic mistake right? Are these business expenses of essential consultants? Maybe. I mean, he could have, if he has an American Express card in the name of Essential Consultants LLC, then sure. AT&T, phone service at the Essential Consultants office? There isn't one. It's a virtual office. 
Did, Mer- did, did essential consultants lease a Mercedes Benz for Michael Cohen? It could be done. People do that stuff all the time. No indication that that's the case here. He's just paying his own personal expenses this way. He paid initiation fees and dues to the core club. A, I've never heard of it, but it is a social club that the Times, New York Times presumably, once described as a portal to power. So following the pattern of Donald Trump, clubbing his way to quote-unquote success. He also cut himself multiple personal checks from essential consultants, amounting to more than $100,000 on top of the million he had already deposited into his Morgan Stanley accounts. Now again, <clears throat> if essential consultants LLC is your primary business vehicle, fine. If it's a corporation that actually, you know, runs your consulting business and you want to pay yourself a salary out of there, that is okay and you can do it. Depositing a million dollars out of it into Morgan Stanley accounts is a more questionable way of doing it. But who's going to sue you? The other shareholders of Essential Consultants? But it's not a good way to hide payments to porn stars. If you want it to, I mean, I guess he maybe, maybe he thought if there's, so long as there's a volume of checks, no one will thumb through them looking for the Stormy Daniels check or Stephanie Clifford check or Peggy Peterson check or what have you. Maybe that was the thinking, but it was bad thinking if that was the case. And at the very least, even though it might be easy to find the Stormy Daniels check, by the time they're rifling through the financial records of Essential Consultants LLC, you are sunk with respect to whatever it is they're looking for. What you should be concerned about is they don't find trails leading to anything else, and that's why you do other things and other accounts. God damn it. It's It's frustrating. (laughs) <laughs> but thank God it happened. In many cases, though, our story continues, the suspicious activity reports highlight activity of potential interest to ongoing investigations, including that of the special counsel, Robert Mueller. Bank compliance officers noted eight payments from a company called Columbus Nova to Cohen's account between January and August of 2017, totaling $500,000. The investigators wrote, that Columbus Nova's biggest client is a company controlled by Victor Vexelberg, whom they described as a as reputed to be a longtime ally of Russian President Vladimir Putin. The report also points out that Andrew Intrater, Vexelberg's relative and the CEO of Columbus Nova, donated more than three hundred thousand dollars to Trump related causes. The report flagged the activity as suspicious, quote, because the CEO's company transferred substantial funds to the personal attorney of Trump. At the same time, the CEO reportedly donated substantial funds to Trump's inauguration fund, oh no, not that fund, and joint fundraising committees for Trump's re-election and the Republican National Committee. Other banks also noticed Cohen's suspicious transactions and filed their own SARs about his activity, Some of those show the banks piecing together the reasons for the transactions from news reports, citing articles from publications, including the Wall Street Journal and Vanity Fair, about Trump, Russia, and secret election season payments, including the payment to Clifford. One filed by City National Bank follows money paid to Cohen by Elliot Broidy, at the time the deputy finance chairman for the Republican National Committee. The report notes, quote, Broidy also owns a private security company, Circinus, which provides services to the U.S. and other governments. The company has hundreds of millions of dollars in contracts with the UAE, United Arab Emirates. Broidy has said that Cohen and another lawyer, Keith Davidson, you remember that guy, worked out a deal in which Broidy would pay $1.6 million to a former Playboy model he had impregnated. Broidy appears to have paid both lawyers for arranging the deal, which is really amazing and not super ethical either. Weird. The City National Report shows that Broidy funneled the payments through Real Estate Attorneys Group, a legal corporation. Broidy seems to have paid Davidson $200,000 and to have sent three payments of $62,500 each to Cohen. One of the essential, one to the essential consultants account and two to the account of Michael D. Cohen and associates. Bad practice. A representative for Broidy said that this description of the payments was, quote, not correct. 
and that Mr. Broidy is not going to detail his payments for legal services to Mr. Cohen. Why did he pay the other woman's lawyer? I don't know. I mean, that may be how he accomplished the payoff for the NDA, but I can't tell. Mr. Broidy is not going to detail his payments for legal services to Mr. Cohen. The representative added Mr. Broidy did not pay Mr. Davidson. Hmm, that does sound dumb then. The records say you did. However, the City National report shows that on November 30th, 2017, a wire of $200,000 was received by the real estate attorneys group from Broidy. Then on December 5th, 2017, $200,000 were transferred from real estate attorneys group to an account belonging to Keith M. Davidson and Associates. Whoops. Michael Avenetti, Avenatti, the attorney representing Clifford, who has released summaries of Cohen's transactions on social media, said the Treasury Department should release all of the SARs immediately to the American public. Suspicious activity reports are ordinarily kept strictly confidential. As a matter of law, SARs are secret to protect the government and to protect financial institutions, the former prosecutor told me. I don't think there's a safe harbor for somebody who discloses it. That's the big problem. The person who leaked it to the Wall Street Journal and or Avenatti is in trouble. According to FinCEN, disclosing a SAR is a federal offense carrying penalties including fines of up to $250,000 and imprisonment for up to five years. The official who released the suspicious activity reports was aware of the risks, but said fears that the missing reports might be suppressed compelled the disclosure. We've accepted this as normal, and this is not normal, the official said. Things that stand out as abnormal, like documents being removed from the system, are of grave concern to me. Of the potential for legal consequences, the official said, to say that I am terrified right now would be an understatement. But, referring to the released report, as well as the potential contents of the missing reports, the official also added, this is a terrifying time to be an American, to be in this situation and to watch all of this unfold. Finally, we've reached the end of this thing. I stretched it out a great deal, but that's the upshot of all this. In other words, the person who released this information said, I know I could go to jail for up to five years. I could be fined up to $250,000 for this. But what I'm seeing here is we're all concerned about the evidence uh, that I have, that I've passed on to Michael Avenatti and Wall Street Journal and others of a million dollars worth of illegal payments. And everybody's like, this might be like a serious, huge corruption case here. Yeah, well, there's three times as much money that was logged in suspicious activity reports before that are somehow mysteriously missing from the database. Now, it may be uh, he, he may have considered and ruled out the possibility, or he may never have thought of the possibility that Mueller or the Southern District of New York or somebody somewhere thinking that they were doing the right thing removed that those reports from the database because it was too hot to handle or having it released would jeopardize the investigation and or the prosecution of the crimes described in the suspicious activity reports or alleged uh, alluded to because it's evidence of a possible crime it doesn't say it was a crime it says here's what happened it may turn out that they're a crime but that's up to the prosecutors to handle so it's possible that a quote-unquote good guy for lack of a better term was behind hiding or removing those SARs from the system. It is also possible, I guess, that a quote-unquote bad guy, like, I don't know, Steve Mnuchin, Treasury Secretary, says, bury this, or somebody else embedded in the Treasury Department or God knows where says, I, I'm going to help Trump. I'm going to quote-unquote help Trump by removing this thing. But instead, of course, it makes things worse for Cohen and or Trump and they did it anyway because they're extraordinarily dumb people. So uh, troubling, to say the least. Uh, now, there's more out there. And uh, related stories, uh, similar stories, stories that branch off of this story. Um, there is, uh, so there's speculation out there. <sighs> about who removed these things and why. And there was good debate going on uh, about how likely it is 
that it was a good guy versus a bad guy. And it led some of the folks thinking about this uh, situation to speculate or to, to think back a little ways. I saw, for instance, a conversation started by NYC Southpaw saying the generous theory that Mueller or the Southern District of New York requested Cohen SARs removed from FinCEN hits a shoal when you realize some but not all were removed. The remaining third First Republic SAR referred to the other two and included Columbus Nova info relevant to both investigations. So that was uh, meant to sort of answer the question of, well, why removed only two of the three? Or if the theory is the other two have more or are or almost exclusively uh, related to the Trump-Russia investigation, but this one is only partially related, so we'll leave that one behind. It doesn't seem to convince Southpaw anyway. But Eli Dickinson, who I don't know, but who uh, describes himself online as the co-founder of Industry Dive, news and info for executives in marketing, energy, healthcare, and more, uh, says, I can't help but think of this story about investigators being mysteriously locked out of FinCEN. And I was like, hey, that's interesting and a good call and a good call back to a story from BuzzFeed News uh, from September of 2017. Jason Leopold who I know some of you have questions about, but I'm okay at the moment. Uh, and Jessica Garrison reporting this story, September 2017. In midst of terror attack, U.S. intel unit was blocked from tracking the terrorists. Now, ordinarily, by the way, that's something that Republicans complain about all the time. You liberals with all your stupid civil rights stuff, you want to make it difficult for us to track down the terrorists and we could be catching terrorists before they act or uh, there could be a ticking time bomb scenario and we need to chase it down and if we don't have access to blah, 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 it's your fault, the blood is on your hands. It might make an interesting argument to hold in the background of, of this story. I, and I, I don't think I realized that this was the case at the time. Subhead here, when knife-wielding terrorists attacked civilians on London Bridge, remember that, and the, uh, the Millwall fan that punched one of them in the face when they all locked themselves into a pub? When knife-wielding terrorists attacked civilians on London Bridge, a key U.S. intelligence unit raced to help, but found they were shut out of critical classified computer networks. The problem has hampered several anti-terrorist efforts and prevented the unit from fully complying with Senate investigations into Donald Trump and Russia. Well, 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 what is this about? Well, I'll tell you. As images of bloody civilians fleeing London Bridge filled news feeds on June 3rd, U.S. intelligence and law enforcement officials raced to help investigate an unfolding terrorist assault on America's closest ally. And the pictures are still coming in and the, and the people are already tracing the money behind the attack. Well, you got to do that. But one group of officers uniquely situated to help was shut out. Officials in the Treasury Department Bureau that tackles financial crimes and terrorist financing. In the first frantic moments of an attack, the Bureau's databases of banking records can yield invaluable clues about who the killers are, who else is in their cells, and whether more attacks are imminent. But not on June 3rd, when the officials got to their secure operations center in Northern Virginia that Saturday night, they discovered that everyone on duty had been blocked from the classified networks their response depended upon. They couldn't open links emailed by the FBI about the suspected terrorists they were supposed to be chasing. They couldn't begin following the threads connecting those suspects to the people who had been funding and supporting them. All the sorts of things, by the way, had it happened under a Democratic administration, you would be hearing, Obama has got the blood of these victims on his hands. But not so, because it's Trump. The lack of access for personnel within the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, never before reported, cost anti-terrorism forces on both sides of the Atlantic crucial time in identifying and pursuing the people and networks around the attackers, according to sources and documents reviewed by BuzzFeed News. Sources said the lack of access has also hindered the congressional inquiry into President Donald Trump and Russia. How did that happen? The Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN for short, 
has not turned over all the records that the Senate Intelligence and Financial Finance Committees requested as part of their probes into the 2016 election. While the agency did send over about 2,000 pages of banking and other financial information to the Intelligence Committee in March, officials said they're still waiting for additional information on transactions between specific people. Sources declined to name those people or describe the transactions, Accusing the Treasury Department of making it impossible for Congress to follow the money, Democratic Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon announced last week, and again, this is September 2017, that he would block the confirmation vote on Trump's nominee to be Treasury Assistant Secretary for Intelligence and Analysis, Isabel Patalunas, until the remaining documents are produced. No idea how that turned out. The Treasury Department did not respond to specific questions from BuzzFeed News about FinCEN's response to terrorist attacks or congressional requests, but issued a statement saying, in part, that its, quote, employees obtain and maintain access to the tools needed to support our partners in law enforcement, the intelligence community, and foreign counterparts, unless they don't. FinCEN's skill at following the money has proven valuable in past terrorist attacks, After the 2013 bombing of the Boston Marathon, one FBI official told BuzzFeed News the name searches FinCEN did were far more effective and thorough than what we had been doing when it came to identifying the attackers and mapping the terrorist network tied to them. Two explanations have emerged for why FinCEN personnel had been locked out. The problem was either a retaliatory move in an increasingly nasty power struggle with the Treasury Department's Office of Intelligence and Analysis which controls the digital keys to classified computer networks, or it was a bureaucratic snafu regarding the keys' timely renewal, or somebody was busy removing the uh, SARs on Michael Cohen at the time. Maybe. Members of Congress who have been briefed on the situation say it needs to be fixed immediately. FinCEN's lack of access puts America's national security at grave risk, said Republican Steve Peirce chair of the House Subcommittee on Terrorism and Illicit Finance. He might be interested in that. As a result of the shutout, FinCEN was unable to effectively respond to critical time-sensitive requests for information from law enforcement partners, including the FBI. Paris wrote in June, on June 9th in a previously undisclosed letter to Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin. Pierce, whose office declined to comment beyond what is in the letter, wrote that the problem was bewildering and unacceptable. In their statement to BuzzFeed, Treasury officials said that they have responded to Peirce to reassure his office that the Office of Intelligence and Analysis, known as OIA, did not conduct a large-scale withdrawal of access. The statement also said that OIA and FinCEN have coordinated closely to make sure employees who need access have it. A CIA officer told BuzzFeed News that he and others who work with FinCEN to track terrorist financing remain worried. When FinCEN officials are locked out, he said, They might not find that one piece of information that stops a terrorist attack or that uncovers criminal wrongdoing among the Trump inner circle, for that matter. It is very interesting that this is the case. And there's a couple more instances of it, I guess, cited in this article, which is not terribly long, but I know we can't get all the way through it as we are running up against our deadline for handing the microphones over to Justice Putnam next. But I thought that was an interesting thought and a good catch by uh did i uh, by eli dickinson uh well done there let's see other interesting things out there uh i didn't mention this one yesterday but it was on my radar but it had been reported by the daily mail that parlio hates and always makes me nervous citing the daily mail though they do tend for the most part to get a jump out ahead of uh, well, what the still, hell is supposed look to at do, that. you moron? Interesting. How, what are we supposed to do, you moron? I'm trying to get my computer to wake up, and apparently if you hit the space bar and you have your cursor position, we had a terrible day with soundboard today, but ignore it all. The stories are good. The Daily Mail, I think, was the first one to break out with the story that the Washington Post is now following up on, and what more do you need to say but to recite the headline? Trump's personal attorney... And here again, we're talking about Michael Cohen solicited one million dollars from the government of Cutter. Yes, Cutter back in the news. And apparently that Trump Tower meeting that Michael Avenatti was releasing photo stills from the C, the C-SPAN footage of Trump Tower. That's who we're talking about. And apparently during that meeting at some point, I guess, for whatever reason, Michael Cohen walks in and says, Cutter, 
Give me a million dollars and then, you know, we'll do stuff for you. What was the stuff? I don't know. Now there's more allegations, of course, that if you don't, you know, was the the uh, refusal to pay the million dollars to maybe my, to Michael Cohen that maybe triggered the uh, pro Saudish stance on the blockade later on, although others have blamed it in the past, including us, when we had uh, evidence that suggested it might have been the failure to lend money to Jared Kushner and his family business. Or maybe it's both. Or maybe he wanted the $1 million for Jared Kushner's business, although he needed a billion. Wasn't that the case? Anyway, that's basically it. And, uh, you know, there's a, it's a juicy story. You should absolutely read it. But, you know, what else do you need to know? He walks in and asks for a million dollars. They didn't give it to him, but whatever. Uh, let's see. Um, there were a few other stories that were worth pointing out, including uh, another investigation in progress by, I think, by David Farenthold as well, uh, looking into the various items disclosed in the financial disclosure report. This one, though, I'm looking at here. I grabbed a tweet from Steve Riley, who's an investigative reporter for USA Today, uh, who says, uh, according to his view of the financial disclosure report, if T Retail LLC, you see another one of those LLCs that Trump has, is the corporate entity behind the Trumpstore.com, which launched in November of 2017, this disclosure indicates the president earned $170,000 oh, $107, in less than two months from an online store selling clothing and tchotchkes with his last name printed on them. And that would ordinarily be another emoluments problem. But whatever, LOL, YOLO, nothing matters. By the way, Trumpstore.com is the source of that misspelled section on uh, where they sell glassware, W-E-A-R. So LOL, LOL Trumpstore.com. But uh, yet another uh, thread to pull on from out of the revised financial disclosure report that everybody was awaiting to see how he would handle the Stormy Daniels situation. Now, tomorrow is Friday, and that will give us an opportunity to discuss what was the other bombshell of yesterday, uh, one would you have likely read all about by now, but perhaps we can discuss it in depth nonetheless tomorrow, or perhaps something else will blow up and prevent us from doing so. But if you haven't read it, do take a look at the New York Times. Yeah, the New York Times reporting under the headline, Codename Crossfire Hurricane. I was born in a crossfire hurricane. That's actually where they took the name from, the Rolling Stones song. And I was never sure what that first word was anyway. But now we know. Codename Crossfire Hurricane, the secret origins of the Trump investigation. I have no doubt. If we save this for tomorrow, Armando uh, is, w will go completely crazy. And he will break down the door of my house to get in here and say, I can't believe how irresponsible the New York Times was in this, David. The New York Times. Can you believe it? And he'd be entirely right. And I think this piece is offered up. I mean, it's in the New York Times. It's offered up in part, ostensibly, to explain the stupid October 2016 headline that says there's no, basically there's no collusion, nothing going on with Trump and Russia. The FBI says he's in the clear, right alongside, of course, the quote-unquote reopening of the investigation into Hillary Clinton and, uh, and everything else that goes along with it. The FBI, colossal mistakes. Comey himself personally, colossal mistakes. We've discussed them all. New York Times, colossal mistake. By the way, uh, colossal mistake in 2004, not telling us about the warrantless surveillance of the Trump administration so that you didn't affect the outcome of an election. Another huge mistake in the 2016 election. I just keep living through these elections that the paper of record keeps screwing up the biggest story of decade after decade after decade. And I'm wondering when they're not going to do this anymore. And maybe there'll be some answers tomorrow. But very, I thought, insightful. It helped explain things. I'm still mad at people. You'll still be mad at people. But maybe you'll understand things a little bit better. Maybe not. Maybe new questions will arise if you haven't read this thing by tomorrow. And provided that nothing else blows up between now and then, it distracts us from this story tomorrow. 
by the way, I can also tell you, uh, F Donald Trump for visiting Melania in the hospital three days in a row. That's a nice gesture. It's very sweet and all. But uh, for two out of the three following uh, the previous days, he has, A, chosen to go at rush hour, and B, caused the mm, D.C. Beltway to close at 6 o'clock, murdering everybody's commute home because he's got to go. All right, fine. Be a nice guy. From Visit Daily my Kelly's Radio, won't you? On NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the K Grow in the Morning Show with David Waltman. What can I tell you about what's going to go on on Justice Putnam's program, The West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, which comes up next right here on Netroots Radio? Now, why should I even bother? I expect the one story. If something else happened in the world, in America, your small corner of it, or elsewhere, even on another planet, it's in Justice Putnam's program. Next, always stay tuned to catch up.